and we're going to be examining Psalm uh, chapter 139 together in a sermon that I've entitled, Too Wonderful for Me, Hope in God's Omnicubeness. Um, I miss math class so much, I, I try and sneak it in wherever I can. That's the, um, God is omni to the third power, specifically God is omniscient, he is omnipresent, and he is omnipotent. It's kind of spoiler alert for your bulletins where we're headed this morning. These are, these are fancy technical ways of saying that God is number one, uh, all, all knowing, God knows everything. Uh, number two, God is everywhere, he's omnipresent. And number three, God can do everything, he's omnipotent, all powerful. Um, we love theology here at West Hills. Theology is the study, logos, of God, theos. We love it not merely out of intellectual curiosity, not because it makes us feel smart or holier than thou to know a bunch of big fancy words. You can take or leave the technical terminology. What matters is that we understand as a church these concepts. So last week when we studied Psalm 121 together, and I referenced God's sovereignty, the perseverance of the saints, uh, Calvinism, justification, sanctification, glorification. Whether or not you can define all of these terms, uh, you need to understand the truths about God that each of these points us to. That is the thing. We love theology as a church and as Christians because we love God. And when you love someone, you want to get to know them in as much depth as possible. And so as believers, we love to study about, to think about, to talk about, to meditate on so that we can more fully worship God. There's another sense, another reason that we love theology too, and that's because what a person believes about God is the most important thing about them as well. Not just for eternity, yes, your theology does determine your eternal destiny, whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life but it's it's the most important thing about you in this life as well your theology has all sorts of real world real life implications we've observed this in a number of examples over the past few weeks now Uh, if you don't have a proper understanding of God's sovereignty God's ultimate authoritative control over everything that comes to pass in this earth, then you will likely be very prone to get anxious and fearful and pessimistic at these latest news about the coronavirus, the spikes, you know, the new restrictions. Like, God, are you asleep up there? God, did you forget about us down here? I posted this reminder uh, this past week on my Facebook Uh, from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, if I send pestilence into the land and pour out my wrath upon it, I have not done it without cause, declares the Lord God. God is not asleep. God's got a reason for everything he does, including sending this virus. We may not like it. We don't enjoy God's wrath, but it is a vitally important attribute of his character for us to understand. And if we're going to have a robust biblical theology, if we're going to respond in the way that we ought to, with repentance instead of despair, then we need good theology. Likewise, if you don't understand God's kingship, that was Psalm 47, you're likely, perhaps still, to either be unhealthily elated or deflated by last week's election results. Theology helps keep in check our tendency towards idolatry, towards elevating a human politician or anything else to a place of supremacy in our lives. Uh, If you don't understand God's keeping, Psalm 121 last week, the perseverance of the saints, then practically as a Christian, you should not be able to fall asleep at night. You really shouldn't. If you honestly think that you're remaining in Christ, in the faith, on the straight and narrow path, if that's ultimately up to you, that you are the one who decisively decides whether or not you will endure till the end or you will lose your salvation, then if you have even the slightest inkling of just how sinful you really are, you shouldn't be able to sleep at night. But if you've got a biblical grasp of a God who is your good and omnicompetent, all-capable shepherd, 
As Jesus said in John 10, uh, no one snatches my sheep out of my hand, then you will sleep soundly at night. Theology is practical. It is massively consequential in our lives. If you believe God listens, you will pray. If you believe that God still speaks through his word, you will read it throughout the week, not just on Sundays. Conversely, if you believe that God exists to help you out in life, that's why God is here, then you'll get frustrated and you'll begin to doubt every time that things don't go your way in life. If you believe God doesn't exist at all, you will live for yourself instead of living for him. Whether we realize it or not, our theology determines everything else about us in life, how we think, how we live, our priorities, everything. And so as we walk through these three massively important theological doctrines this morning, these three omnis, we need to remember this is not some cold, dry theological exercise. It certainly wasn't for King David who authored Psalm 139. David is not interested in mere abstract, uh, impersonal theology. Psalm 139 is what we might call applied theology, practical theology, personal theology. David's concern, and it should be ours as well, isn't just that God knows everything, but that God knows everything about him, about you, about me. It's not just that God is everywhere, but that God goes everywhere with me. And it's not enough to say that God can do everything. David recognizes that God has done everything for him. And on the basis of those three personal theological observations, David is going to conclude in verses 17 through 24 with three specific directives, three responses for us that a proper view of God ought to invoke, elicit from us. And so, would you stand one more time with me as you're able and turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 139. I'll be reading from the uh, English Standard Version which we have extra copies of at the info bar we'd love to give to you. If you don't have a Bible this morning, but we'll have uh, words on the screen in front as well. Hear the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are all your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. 
and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its leading in our lives. It helps search us, test us. Your word cuts through us like a double-edged sword, dividing our sin from our, our, our conviction of sin from our, our encouragement this morning. God, we need to be both challenged by your word and encouraged by it this morning. God, as we seek to submit ourselves under the authority of your word now, would you, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts in the same way that you spoke to King David all those many years ago as he penned them? For our good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Three attributes of God inspire three responses from us. Number one, God is omniscient. He's omniscient. God knows everything. And more specifically, He knows everything about me. He knows, verse one, my heart. David says, you've searched me and known me. The Hebrew word that David uses six times in this chapter, yada, refers to intimate, personal knowledge. This isn't like, do you know Will Duvall? Yeah, I think I know him. Isn't he the you know, tall, bald, really, really attractive guy? This is not like, do you know about him? This is, do you know me? No, no. You know, like in middle school when you would say, do you like her? Do you like, like her? This is, do you know, no. God knows us to our very core, the very essence of us. David's going to affirm in verse 13, you form my innermost parts. Right? The, 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 the core of me, my heart, my soul, the essence of my personhood. That's the depth at which God knows us. And so the rest of what he acknowledges here is, is just pretty straightforward and follows logically by comparison. If God knows us at that level of depth, number two, of course he knows my actions. Uh, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. So David is going to employ a common literary device here called merism, uh, used frequently in the Hebrew language. We're going to find it all over this chapter. It's when a writer uses a pair of opposites to represent a full spectrum of you know, things in between those two extremes. So here, if God knows when I get up in the morning and when I lay down at night, then by implication, God knows everything that happens in between them as well, all day long. That's, that's the sense that David's saying. And he'll say in verse 3, some of your translations read, you know my going out and my lying down, my entire day. Another way to interpret that, though, is, is to say that God knows my public life, my going out, God knows who I am, you know, when I, when I go out and I put on, you know, the, the face, the makeup, the, the persona that I wear out in public, but he also knows my private life as well, my lying down, who I am behind closed doors, who I am when no one else is watching. God knows. But on top of that, verse 2b, God knows my thoughts too. He, he says, you discern my thoughts from afar. Psalm ninety four eleven says, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. There's another implied merism here as well with the word afar. David is going to emphasize all through this chapter how near God is, but here in verse 2, he juxtaposes that with God's farness. You know it from afar. The theological terminology here is God's transcendence on the one hand. God is above, beyond, independent of, even outside of everything else in the universe literally supernatural. God transcends time and space. He cannot be contained even by the vast scope of the entire created order that he himself brought into existence. That is God's transcendence, and yet God is simultaneously imminent. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God is available. He's around. God is not the deadbeat absent father portrayed by deism, a God who cared enough to create us, but that's about it. He stepped out of the picture. So our God knows our heart, our actions, our thoughts. In verse 3, he knows our future as well. He says, you searched out my path and are acquainted with all my ways. Not just my previous ways, all my ways. God knows which path you're going to take even before you choose it. Now, we can sit here and have a philosophical debate 
over whether or not you can truly have free will in any meaningful sense of the term or whether God's pre-knowledge necessarily implies his predetermination. And if so, how can we still be held morally responsible, culpable for our actions? We can get our coffee refills and hash that one out this afternoon after the business meeting if you want to come back. But what is clear here is that God knows our past, present, and future. Jeremiah 29, 11. And every Christian's favorite promise of God for, for Israel in the Old Testament that we love to, to steal and apply to our own lives. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a what? A future and a hope. God knows our future because they are his plans for us in the first place. We could spend all day just on God's omniscience here. But I will click, quickly hit the rest of these. Verse 4, God knows my words. He knows my words even before a word is on my tongue, David says. You know it all together. Verse 5, he knows my limits. You hem me in behind and before because God knows how limited I really am. Uh, God therefore lays his hand of protection upon me. In summary, verse 6, God knows everything. He knows it all. Such knowledge, David says, is too wonderful for me. It's, it's high. I cannot attain it. As the Apostle Paul puts it in his doxology at the end of Romans chapter 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been His counselor? No one. No, oh, we can't understand. His ways are so much higher than ours. And Paul and David both come to the, the kind of uh, same conclusion about God's omniscience. They essentially say, don't think about it so hard that you hurt yourself. If you think about God's omniscience too much, you will hurt your brain. Trying to wrap your head around it, but ponder it hard enough to be just really blown away by just how wonderful God's knowing is and here's the most wonderful part about his knowledge friends that god knows everything about you he knows you to your very core the deepest darkest parts of you that you don't let anyone else into that no one else sees not your spouse not your best friend not even yourself i i'm convinced we all have those parts of ourselves that we're, we're, we're too scared to even admit and acknowledge and hold up to the mirror for ourselves because they're too hard, they're too dark, they're too scary, they're too painful. God knows it all. And He still loves you. He still loves you. He knows you better than anyone. And He loves you more than anyone. Think about that for a minute. There is nothing that you have done, said, thought, or felt in your entire life to this point and nothing that you will ever do, say, think, or feel that your omniscient God does not already know God cannot be surprised and yet He still loves you. He desires a relationship with you. That's the thing. Each of these three attributes should really evoke a sort of dual opposite responses within us. This is where we're going to make theology practical and personal this morning. Let me try to get at it this way. If I ask you this same question twice, and I'm just going to change my voice inflection and the way that I say it, tell me how you feel when I remind you that God knows everything about you, right? When I say that God knows everything about you, I mean everything. On the one hand, God's omniscience should spark fear within the heart of every self-aware person on this planet. God knows what you stayed up late watching last night. God knows what you said when you got caught off on the highway on the way over here this morning. On your way to church nonetheless. You are such sinners. God knows what you thought when the alarm went off this morning and you wanted to hit the snooze and just sleep through worship. Some of you did on the live stream, right? Or you woke up just in time to keep the PJs on. Right? God knows what you felt when your coworker got the promotion you wanted. 
what you felt when your sister-in-law announced that she was pregnant with the baby you wanted. When your family lets you know that they're canceling their trip for Thanksgiving because of COVID, you were relieved? What kind of husband, you know, father, son, daughter are you? God knows it all, friends. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that is and should be, on the one hand, a very sobering, sobering realization for all of us. And yet, when I say it this way, God knows everything about you. He knows everything about you. You ought to also feel, at the same time, paradoxically, incredibly comforted by the reality that unlike every other person in your life, there is absolutely nothing new that God could ever discover about you that would change his mind or change his feelings towards you. His favor, his love for you. That is, Romans 8.39 assures us, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God already proved it, Romans 5.8. God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. That's how much he loved you while you were yet a sinner. While he knew those deepest, darkest parts, he went to the cross for you. Unlike everyone else in your life, God knows exactly the extent of your sin, how sinful you really are, and he really does still love you. And that, friends, is knowledge too wonderful for me. I don't know about you, that is knowledge so high, I cannot attain it, I cannot begin to comprehend it. God's fully informed, eyes wide open, love of a wretched sinner like me. Praise God. Number two, God is also omnipresent. He's omnipresent, all present. It's a bit telling, isn't it, that after his initial amazement at God's omniscience, the very next thought that David has when he considers God knowing everything about him is, how can I run away? It's David's next thought in verse 7. Like, I get to get out of here away from this God who knows everything about me. God knows about the whole Bathsheba thing. God knows about the whole killing her husband Uriah thing so I could steal her to be my own wife. Moreover, God knows I'm still tempted to pull the very same stunt all over again even after God has punished my sin, even with Bathsheba now in my harem. Every time I see another attractive neighbor bathing on her roof again, you think David learned his lesson? You think David never had another lustful thought his entire life? No, the reason that when David meditates on God's omniscience, God knows every thought, every impulse, every deed, every desire of my heart, there is a reason that David's next thought is, where can I run? He says, where where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? But, but David recognizes, as the New Testament author of Hebrews declares, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Naked and exposed. Sounds like a new reality TV show, right? spiritually naked and exposed how does that feel to be naked and exposed before the holy perfect god of the universe and david once again emphasizes god's omnipresence with two more merisms here these pairs of opposites to highlight comprehensiveness david says in verse 8 if i ascend to heaven you are there if i make my bed down in sheol you are there. Now the basic point here is simple enough. God is everywhere. From the highest heights, heaven, to the lowest depths, Sheol. And everywhere in between, you cannot escape God's presence. But some of you might be having trouble getting past the language here of of that second verse. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol was in some ways the Old Testament equivalent of hell. 
our understanding of hell. And, and in fact, some of your Bible translations will even translate it that way. If I go down to hell, in verse 8, and perhaps you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought God couldn't be in the presence of sin. God certainly can't be in hell then. I know he's supposed to be omnipresent, but surely even God's omnipresence has its limits. The truth is, this is orthodox theology this morning, the truth is the biblical vision of hell, Revelation 14.10, is a place where unrepentant sinners will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so as J.M. Boyce puts it, Hell is not ruled by the devil in spite of popular descriptions. The thing that makes hell so terrible is that it is run by God. So the short answer to that ask the pastor question is, yes, God is present even in hell. His justice and his wrath exist there for eternity. But remember, David isn't merely concerned with God's being everywhere. David's care is that God is everywhere with him. He wants to know, he needs to know God is everywhere with him. I, if I ascend to heaven, if I descend to Sheol, verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the wings of the morning is a Hebrew idiom for the sunrise, which of course happens as far east as the eye can see. Where are we? East as the eye can see. And the uttermost parts of the sea, in David's case, that he references would have been the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea, as far west as he could see from Jerusalem. And so, once again, he's reiterating, up, down, east, west, God is everywhere. And again, most importantly, he's everywhere with me. He says, verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. The Protestant uh, reformers used the phrase coram deo, literally before the face of God, to describe our rightful response to the reality of God's omnipresence. Now, many of you are fans of Ligonier Ministries, founded by the late, great R.C. Sproul. If you aren't, you should be. They offer excellent, uh, short, power-packed, bite-sized, biblically-rich devotionals. At the end of every Ligonier devotional, there's a section entitled coram deo, intended to give the reader an idea of how to live this truth out practically before the face of God each day. And here's how R.C. Sproul himself summed up this idea of Coram Deo. He said, Coram Deo captures the essence of the Christian life. To live Coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we're doing, wherever we're doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. The Christian who compartmentalizes his or her life into two sections of the religious and the non-religious has failed to grasp the big idea. The big idea is that all of life is religious. To divide life between religious and non-religious is itself sacrilege. In other words, if God is everywhere, always with me, then all of life is infused with great meaning and purpose because it all holds the potential of bringing God glory. That's why the Apostle Paul exhorts us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's even a way to eat and drink that brings God glory. There's also a way to eat and drink that dishonors him too. And so David's going to conclude Psalm 139 and verse 24 by saying, search me, see if there's any grievous way in me, because God, I don't want to bring any offense to your name. I want to honor you in all that I say and do and think and feel. Think of God's omnipresence. Did any of y'all grow up being told, you know, don't do anything you wouldn't do with your grandmother sitting next to you? Anybody else? Is that just something they told middle school boys where I'm from? Okay. God's being omnipresent is kind of like that, except instead of your grandma, he's the almighty God of the universe. Right? And, and he's with you all the time. Again, let's make it practical and personal this morning. What goes on in your heart when I remind you, God is everywhere you go. He's always with you. Right? We should feel that. 
I could list a bunch of hypothetical examples again, make you blush again. But how about when I say, God is with you everywhere you go? Right? We should feel that too. We should feel the tension of both those things. And I think that's the beauty of the imagery that David uses there in verse 11. Once again, I think we can read verse 11 in two very different ways. He writes, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. Typically in the Bible, darkness is a metaphor for one of two things. Either for sin, like when Jesus said in John 3, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So darkness can represent sin, or it can simply symbolize our sorrow. As in Psalm 23, when David writes, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, you, Lord, are with me. And here's the thing. Both need to be reminded of God's omnipresence. The sinner needs to be reminded that God is always with you everywhere you go, sinner. And those in sorrow need to be reminded that God is always with you everywhere you go. And the good news of God's omnipresence is that His light, His light confronting the darkness is available to them both. David declares it in verse 12. He says, even darkness is as light to you. It evokes that image from the the, the end of the book of Revelation. Beautiful image where there's no need for a sun anymore because the glory of the Lord is going to light up all of heaven. Spiritually speaking, that is already our new reality in Christ. Jesus said in John 1, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Not just will not overcome it. It has not overcome it past tense he is the light he shines into our darkness luke 179 he came to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and in his omnipresence that means that now his light is always available to us friends that that there really is nowhere that god isn't and there's nowhere that he isn't willing to go to pursue you to seek you out. It was verses 7 through 12 of Psalm 139 that prompted Francis Thompson to pen his now famous The Hound of Heaven poem, in which he describes how hard he tried unsuccessfully to hide from God. And friends, that's my testimony. You, you heard Ben's this morning, that, that's mine. I ran about as fast and as far for as long as I possibly could, trying to avoid having to deal with the really inconvenient truth of an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God who wasn't me. I don't think I quite made it all the way down to hell, and I certainly didn't make it up to heaven, but no matter where I ran, how fast or how far, the hound of heaven never stopped pursuing me. Is that your story this morning? Is it your story? Perhaps you're still trying to hide from him today. You need to hear the good news of his omnipresence. He will find you. In fact, he never actually left you to begin with. He's always there. But he's good. He's light. You can trust him. Trust in Jesus. Come to the light. Let him overcome the darkness in your life, both your sin and your sorrow, with his light. You can come out of hiding today. You can be set free to walk in the light with him. Number three, God is omnipotent. All-powerful. Now, David could have used another merism here. He could have said something like, you created the farthest reaches of the universe and you created me. uh, David could have gone to the grandest scale and then the smallest and everything in between, but David doesn't do that. And I think he doesn't because he knows that all of all of God's works in creation, none is so amazing, so awe-inspiring, more worthy of celebration and praise than the human person. If you want the most powerful evidence of God's all-powerfulness, you need look no farther than the mirror. Neuroscientists today admit that we know more about outer space than we do about our own brains. 
You want to talk about knowledge that is too wonderful for us, too high to attain. Knowledge of ourselves escapes us. That's how wonderful we've been made. You can just hear the wonder stirred in David's heart as he contemplates God's omnipotence evidenced in his own conception. David exclaims, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are all your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. That same amazing, knowledge-defying brain of yours that I just mentioned was present at just five weeks after your conception. Moreover, Psalm 139 makes it absolutely clear that your life, that every life, human life, begins even before brain activity. It begins at your conception. The moment that sperm began fertilizing that egg and God began knitting together a new person, you were born. You weren't birthed yet, but you were born. At that very moment, God began to know you intimately. God tells the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Psalm 139, then is the most pro-life passage in all of Scripture. That's why I preached from these four verses back in January for our Sanctity of Life Sunday. And so I would simply refer you back to that sermon, fearfully and wonderfully made, for the full scoop on the sanctity of life. But here's the Cliff's notes. Has to be said. Abortion is without a doubt the most egregious, most horrific, most God-defying, defiling social justice blight on our country, on our world today. And it is vitally important For us, that being pro-life isn't just reduced to being a talking point every four years during an election cycle or once a year on Sanctity of Life Sunday. In fact, we here at West Hills are in the beginning stages of exploring what a life team might look like for us as a church. A team that would help us as a church put our money and our energy where our mouths are when it comes to being not just pro-fetus, pro-baby, pro-child, pro-family, pro-single mother, pro-disability, pro-infirmed, pro-elderly. From the womb to the tomb, at every point in between, we want to care about people as much as our God does. So if you're interested in being a part of that team, let me know. That's what David affirms about God here in verse 16 says, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. It doesn't just mean that there's a number sitting beside every person's name in God's book. How many days you're going to live. The point is that God has actually preordained every part of every one of those days. Everything that you will ever say, do, think, feel. God knows it in advance. He is sovereign over it. Nothing catches him by surprise. He's omnipotent. God controls everything. And even the end of your life, David bookends God's omnipotent care for us in verse 18 when he says, I am awake and I'm still with you. Elsewhere in the Bible, death is euphemized as falling asleep. And so when David says here, when I awake, you're still with me, many commentators point out that he's referencing resurrection. That's even in the valley of the darkest shadow of all of death we can actually fear no evil because why god is with us he'll never leave you or forsake you and when you at last wake up on that most glorious of all days of your life on the other side of eternity you will finally behold him face to face but until then once again god's omnipotence should elicit that same dual response from us. Because on the one hand, we realize that God has all power over you. Anyone else have a parent growing up that 
reminded you sometimes, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Anybody else ever heard that one? That is most true eternally of God. That's why Jesus warns us, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both your soul and your body in hell. That's God. Only God has the power to send you to hell. Fear him. And yet, on the other hand, for those of us who are now in Christ, when you hear that beautiful promise that God has all power over you, that should be reassuring to you because you know that you can rest easy trusting in the promise of Romans 8.31 that God is now for you, not against you. God not only can do everything to you, He can do everything for you. And this recognition ought to lead us to three responses. Got to be quick here at the end. God's omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence ought to inspire, number one, our infatuation. Verses 17 and 18, God's awesomeness arouses our adoration, our worship. David marvels in verses 17 and 18, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. We should take time, simply, every day, simply to adore God for who he is. Number two, perhaps less obvious to us, God's omnicubeness ought to inspire our indignation. Our infatuation and our indignation. Christopher Ashe notes in his commentary, parts of this psalm are great favorites. They appear on devotional calendars and coffee mugs and Instagram pictures. We love them, but then we reach verses 19 through 22, and we wish that that section were not there. These verses seem to break the heartwarming devotional flow. But I want to suggest to you this morning, as I have in prior sermons, that love itself, rightly understood, necessarily implies a kind of hatred of its opposite. Hatred is just the equal and opposite, sometimes latent, albeit no less real, reaction in every instance of love. If I love my children, I'm going to hate anything that threatens them. And so David is just being brutally honest here in verses 19 through 22 when he exclaims, God, I wish that you would just slay the wicked. I hate those who hate you. With complete hatred, I count them my enemies. And so while Jesus in the New Testament, of course, commands us to love our enemies, there is this very real sense of, in which our love for God ought to provoke indignation for anything and anyone that opposes him. Finally, number three, God's awesomeness ought to inspire our infatuation, our indignation, and our invitation. Because here's the thing, invitation. We can only pray that imprecatory prayer of verses 19 through 22, asking God to slay the wicked, for so long before we have to turn the mirror back on ourselves, right? Before David has to realize, wait a minute, I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. I'm a bad father. As David reminds himself in Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? I mean, who, who could stand? Certainly not David. Certainly not me, your pastor. If we're lining up to throw stones at folks, but you've got to be sinless to pick up a stone, I'm as stoneless as they come. That's why David ends with this threefold prayer. In verses 23 and 24, he says, Search me, try me, and lead me. Number one, search me. The psalm ends where it began with God searching his knowing, but this time David is actually inviting it. Because David understands. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so number two, David prays, God, try me, test me. David actually invites into his life the kind of hardships and trials that refine and strengthen 
our faith because he knows that God's aim in life is not your happiness, but your holiness. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, Rejoice if you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do we pray that prayer? brothers and sisters. How often do you pray, God, send trials into my life to test me to refine my faith, to make me holier? And finally, number three, lead me in the way everlasting. After searching and testing, David is convinced that he is no longer qualified for everlasting life on his own merit. If I'm going to make the cut into heaven, it is going to have to take God's leading and so I ask you in closing friends is God leading you have you searched your heart have you prayed that audacious prayer God test me and have you realized like David the only way you make the cut is if he leads you is the omniscient omnipresent omnipotent Lord over all the universe also the Lord of your life He can be this morning if you will but respond to his invitation to you. Would you pray with me?